Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, finish up our uh, chapter three discussion and uh, then get into our uh, chapter four discussion. Uh, we should be able to get through both of those today. So uh, we were talking about ethical um, issues dealing with business and uh, we talked about some of the uh, different scandals, et cetera, and you saw a couple of uh, things that have come up as a result of uh, some of the uh, uh, ethical um, issues. And so what happens is uh, the government ends up getting involved if companies don't you know, police themselves properly with their ethics. And so uh, throughout the years, there have been different uh, consumer protection laws uh, that have come out and uh, you have this uh, customer bill of rights and you can see that's back in the 60s where we're almost like 54 years ago. Um, they don't mention it here but to Ralph Nader, uh, a name you may have heard of before, is somebody that uh, wrote a, a book called Unsafe at Any Speed and it was his analysis of, uh, I think it was a Ford Carrera, I forget the vehicle, but his point was that the thing was unsafe at any speed. It didn't have the appropriate uh, safety, vehicle safety requirements, and uh, that book and those observations started leading to consumer protection requirements that we put seat belts in cars, airbags, etc. All of this has come out of uh, you know these uh, consumer protection laws and the Consumer Bill of Rights, uh, right to safety right to choose information and the right to uh, be heard if there is some uh, problems and uh, all of these have led to you know businesses having to operate in a more regulated environment and deal with uh, you know um, uh, legal laws and regulations of various industries auto industry etc and uh, so you come over Every device is going to have to be vetted from now on before we can uh, start the class, apparently. <laughs> okay, there we go. When one doesn't work, we have a replacement for it. Okay, so... Um, one of the major laws um, that came up has been this Sarbanes-Oxley Act that I may have mentioned in here before. Uh, Sarbanes was the Democrat senator. Oxley was the Republican House member. And they got together to come up with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And what it basically did was institute uh, severe penalties and regulation for entities that engaged in fraudulent financial reporting. And uh, there were really two key um, scandals that caused this. One was uh, what we mentioned on this slide, Enron. And what happened was Enron was basically reporting revenues even though they weren't actually making sales to external parties. The sales were all to uh, affiliates that they controlled. Well, if you have an affiliate that you control, that is not considered a sale. That is something that should be eliminated for financial reporting purposes. I can't sell stuff to myself and make it look like I've got these huge profits. And so uh, it was somewhat complex. And I think that to the large extent, Enron issue is not what brought in Sarbanes-Oxley as much as the second one that isn't listed here. Enron's a little more famous, but the one that really brought on um, Sarbanes-Oxley was now the second one that came around on the heels of Enron, which was WorldCom. WorldCom was a global communication company, and what they were doing is they were taking items that should have been expensed against their revenue, and they were capitalizing those items, showing them in their balance sheet to make their net income look larger. And once that happened, uh, it was such a basic thing that they were doing that everybody could understand it, and they came up with Sarbanes-Oxley. And what Sarbanes-Oxley said is that if you engage in fraudulent financial reporting, there will be criminal 
criminal penalties associated with that. And so now CEOs, CFOs that if they engage in this sort of things could be uh, liable for um, some sort of uh, uh, jail sentence. And so uh, uh, this is something that is... Uh, you know, making it hopefully uh, more scary for companies to do the type of things that they were doing. Um, Arthur Anderson was their accounting firm, and as a result of all this, they went out of business. They were one of the top eight accounting firms in the country, or top six at the time, and as a result of this, they went out of business because they were seen as uh, being complicit to a certain extent. They ended up shredding some of their audit evidence, et cetera, as a result of this, and uh, so they went out of business. Um, now, they don't mention here another major regulation is something called the Dodd-Frank Act, which came up in about 2008, and that came up because of all the financial issues that uh, came up in 2008 that led to the financial crisis and that um, woman that I had on the slide earlier, the congressman, the senator, uh, congresswoman, uh, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren was uh, one of the key uh, people that pushed for the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And so now if you feel that you're uh, somehow being treated unfairly with a loan, et cetera, there's a bureau there that you can go to and, uh, and appeal your case to. Uh, they wouldn't appoint her as the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, so she ran for Senate and got elected to Senate as opposed to uh, um, trying to be the head of this bureau. And uh, now she is uh, you know, pretty much an advocate for consumer rights, and particularly in the financial arena. And I think it's worth watching that speech, and I'll put it up on uh, – on, on canvas for us so we can so you can look at that a little bit later to see some of the things that she had to say so we keep having these issues 2001 2002 2008 and they keep putting regulation in place to say well this is so these things will never happen again here we are what eight years later 2016 we've got this uh, wells fargo thing going on now so i don't know i think that uh human uh, what's human greed is going to always drive these issues and uh, we'll just have to continue to have regulation to try to uh, avoid some of these things um, there is this idea of whistleblowers um, these folks here uh, Jeffrey uh, Wigand uh, I think exposed some of the uh, comments that were being made by tobacco companies about how to get people addicted to tobacco and that sort of thing, putting nicotine in it, that sort of thing. This Sergeant uh, Joseph Darby uh, brought out uh, some of the abuses that were going on at uh, uh, Abu Ghraib, I think was the name of the, uh, the Iraqi uh, prison where they were torturing some of the uh, some of the prisoners and that sort of thing. Okay, so these whistleblowers have brought things to light uh, over the years, and uh, so uh, what happens is once companies have these sort of uh, problems, they try to get their way, work their way out of it by finding a leader that will help lead them, uh, empowering employees. Again, uh, you know. Um, making sure the employees know that they can bring these sort of things to light. Although with the case of Enron, the employees were trying to bring these things to light and they kept uh, ignoring it. Um, but then also redesign internal rewards, getting away from maybe uh, placing an uh, overemphasis on meeting earnings targets, et cetera, and uh, trying to go ahead and maybe um, put more incentives towards ethical behavior. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of questions here. Sarbanes-Oxley Act. B, does what? CEOs verify companies' financial statements and vouch for their accuracy with the SEC. And uh, basically, if there is a problem, they sign off, and later on there's a problem with those financial statements, they could uh, face jail time. So it's really dealing with what? dealing with financial reporting, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act coming off of some of the uh, fraudulent stuff that was with Enron. And as I mentioned, they don't sit on the slides, but WorldCom as well. Okay. Uh, this one, which of the following companies formerly was a top 25 fortune 
company that's no longer a business, Enron, and their auditors, Arthur Anderson, which was also a big uh, CPA firm that uh, went out of business because of this whole thing. Okay, A whistleblower, someone who reports misconduct occurring in their workplace, and they are protected by whistleblower laws, by the way. There are laws in place that if there's a retaliation against a whistleblower, um, you know, the, uh, the company could be found liable for, uh, for interfering with that process. Okay, um, so how can we create new markets with uh, ethical focus? Um, you can see some of the things up here, offering clean fuel. And you almost look at a company, um, even though it's not fuel, but you look at a company like uh, Tesla is really creating a market with a economic focus, right? I mean, a, I should say an ethic, ethical focus um, by creating cars that don't pollute the air, right? And uh, their leadership really in the industry is causing more and more uh, cars to, uh, you know, expectation by consumers now is that they will have low emission cars, which of course saves fuel, etc. Um, medical vaccines, the creation of that. Did I talk about Jonas Salk in here? I don't think I did. Jonas Salk. Anybody ever heard of Salk? Who's Jonas Salk? No? Uh, Jonas Salk. Now, this is going back sometimes, but it's a good example, I think, when we talk about creating vaccines. Uh, this is in the 19... I think it's like the 19... 50s, 1950s, uh, he created the vaccine for polio, okay? Prior to uh, the creation of that vaccine, polio was something that was feared. It was like, uh, it's probably not the best example, but sort of like, you know, it was like the cancer of that day, okay? Everyone was afraid that their kid was going to come down with polio. It was a big deal. And... Um, my dad always talks about the fear, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, around in the 30s and 40s when he was a kid about, oh, you know, someone so, and so got polio and, oh, geez, I hope my kid doesn't get polio, all that kind of stuff. And what he did was he created the vaccine. You probably don't even know when you were born, you got a polio vaccine shot. And that polio vaccine, vaccine uh, sets it up so that nobody even gets polio, or at least on a rare occasion somebody gets polio, maybe if they're in an underdeveloped country that doesn't have the uh, vaccine process, but now polio is pretty much defeated because of this vaccine, okay, so you're a pretty smart guy, right, to sit there and come up with the vaccine that not, that, so that you don't even get the disease to begin with that was scaring everybody at that time. Well, something that Jonas Salk did is he did not patent the uh, vaccine. Once he created that vaccine, he didn't patent it. What does that mean if he doesn't patent it? Huh? Say again? He doesn't own it, which means what? Anybody can produce it. Remember, we talked about what? We talked about if it's pure competition, that's going to bring the price down of that particular item. And he did that so that it would be readily available to the uh, public so that everyone could get that vaccine. If he had patented, he probably could have made a, you know, he would have made a fortune off the thing. Instead, he just uh, went ahead and made that available to everyone in the market. So uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of, uh, examples like that um, these days and we saw the examples where uh, we have some of these pills and whatnot that they want to charge you outrageous prices for so uh, when you need them to to survive uh, going green okay I don't know about this fighting censorship whatever I mean there's a lot of I don't put that quite on the level of some of these other things I mean I guess you could fight censorship but um, going green okay is um, you know, this lady's wearing green, okay, to show, to emphasize that. And what, um, you know, basically um, improving our product, et cetera, by going green could actually be cheaper. Didn't we talk about this? 
Okay, where I talked about, so I think we talked about this one, where we talked about some uh, low-income housing that I was looking at, and they actually reported to us at the GAO, my office where I work, that they actually were saving money by uh, going green and putting more energy-efficient products in the homes that they were developing, et cetera. Okay, um, so again, uh, steps to make sure employees get off to an ethical start, having a code of conduct. Uh, mission statement, um, having orientation programs that make sure that uh, the employees are aware of the ethical focus of the company. Okay, And so you can see some of the things that uh, they could do here. Create a hotline for anonymous reports. That's almost facilitating, in fact that is facilitating what? The whistleblower process um, and then employ ongoing ethics training, all ways to uh, focus the company's ethics. Okay, so when a firm goes green, what? They are being eco-friendly, right? Okay, which of the following steps would least likely improve the culture of ethical, responsible uh, conduct in a business? And the answer is A here, and the issue with A is that this uh, information that gives the ethical code of the company um, is being distributed what to clients outside of the company that's not what we're looking for we're trying to make sure that the ethical communication is happening internally um, to the company so that our employees know about these things so. okay all right any questions about chapter three then all right and I'll try to get those uh, videos up on canvas uh, the couple of ones where the folks were getting called onto the carpet there in Congress I thought the one with Elizabeth Warren was particularly uh, entertaining it's about an eight minute video and it starts out kind of slow and then she just starts uh, really giving those well far Wells Fargo's guys a run for their money so okay all right so let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, chapter four now and uh, you can see chapter four up on canvas now and I've put the uh, quiz up there as well as well as um, the um, the the uh, quiz and um, I've put the quiz questions into the slides pretty much as well, but you should always look at the file there. You can always take out the answers if you want to work that as an exam type thing for practice uh, with, for the uh, midterm, which we have coming up in October. Okay. Okay. So learning objectives, really understanding about globalization. Okay, and the impact of globalization, uh, both uh, you know um, on business but also um, some of the social aspects. And uh, I found it kind of interesting um, watching the debate or listening to the debate, on, debate presidential debate on the way home, uh, how much of some of the issues that we're talking about here are driving a lot of the conversation um, in uh, the debate. And I'll kind of point some of those things out as we go through. Okay, so globalization, what happens here? Increased globalization. Um, now in that companies are doing business more often across uh, company uh, borders, right? And you can see um, they put Canada in the middle here and the U.S. and China and the different countries uh, that they're mentioning here, okay? So we have globalization of markets. We have globalization of production. So we've got a couple of things that come up when we talk about globalization. One is outsourcing. Outsourcing is taking a function of the company and putting it outside of the United States. For example, accounting. I had a friend that uh, worked for a uh, property management company, and uh, she told me one day, guess what? I'm getting laid off in two months. What happened? Well, they outsourced the accounting function to um, to India, and it's going to be my job for the next two months to train 
um, the people that are taking over the accounting function and then I'm out and I'm going to have to go find another job somewhere. So this kind of stuff happens where they take a function of the company and they outsource it to an outside company or organization and that outsourcing could actually go what? Go overseas, right? Okay. When we have uh, offshore outsourcing, so that's called out, out, sh offshore outsourcing when those functions go to a um, foreign uh, country. So we can have outsourcing in general, it doesn't have to be outside of the U.S. And when we go offshoring or out, offshore outsourcing, uh, that's where it goes to a uh, foreign loca location. Okay. Now, uh, what happens? What has led to accelerate? What has l l led to accelerated globalization? Uh, decline, decline in trade and investment barriers, and we're going to see that uh, some of the trade agreements that have been in place uh, for several years now have uh, helped with this. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that has led to uh, increased globalization. And then simple technological innovations, communication, transportation, information, technology. I mean, think about what you can do now with the Internet that you couldn't do just 20 years ago uh, that is going to increase the ability to do, uh, you know, have global uh, economic activity. Um, so if you take a look. Uh, there's a growing role for developing nations with globalization, uh, particularly those with emerging economies, um, potential for lower costs. Uh, remember, our factors of production, and one of them being labor. So the opportunity for uh, lower cost of labor is increasing uh, opportunities for developing nations. Increase in non-U.S. foreign direct investment. What happens here? Well, it used to be all about U.S. companies investing in foreign subsidiaries. Now you have an increase of foreign subsidiaries investing in, or foreign companies, I should say, because in that case, the U.S. company would be the subsidiary. You know, companies outside of the U.S. buying um, U.S. subsidiaries. So instead of the you know investing always going out of the U.S. into other countries, now you have other countries investing in U.S. companies. Um, rise in multinational enterprises and uh, increasing democratization, uh, basically making it easier to have uh, business relations in countries that uh, that establish a democratic government. So these things. Uh, have led to a uh, rise in uh, globalization of business, some of these trends. Um, when you, we look at uh, international competition, we have a couple of different uh, things that we look at, comparative advantage versus absolute advantage. Um, and so what happens? Comparative advantage is when a, a country has an advantage for producing a particular type of product um, compared to another country. So if you look at the United States, for example, um, the United States has somewhat of a competitive uh, comparative advantage, I should say, when it comes to agriculture because of the mere location of where the country is, right? It's much easier to grow, um, you know, agriculture here than it is going to be, say, in Siberia and Russia or something like that. So the U.S. Uh, has a comparative advantage and uh, it, compared to other countries. Um, absolute advantage is when the uh, country is the, uh, the, the basically the, the best uh, producer of any product. And uh, that has little to do with their productivity. It just means that they are in a position to be able to produce something better than anyone else. You could almost put agriculture in t for the U.S. towards that absolute advantage. Um, comparative advantage is really if a particular company's uh, country, I keep saying company, country is good at a particular product is more of the comparative. Okay. Um, taking a look at uh, some of the benefits to international trade, higher standard of living. What happens? If we have international trade 
and a particular country can produce a good uh, cheaper, more efficiently than anyone else, what's going to happen? They're going to import those goods to, say, the U.S. or wherever, maybe the U.S. In, importing those goods into another country, and we're going to be able to acquire those goods at a cheaper price. So what's going to happen? I'm going to be able to now have more money available for other items rather than have to spend as much on that product than I was when it was being made, say, inside of the U.S. at a higher price. And so overall, my standard of living should go up because now I'm able to acquire additional items uh, with the excess funds that I'm not using to purchase that other product that I was buying at the higher prices. On the other side of the coin, what's going to happen? Whoever I am purchasing those products from should also have an increased, uh, you know, uh, higher living standard because now they have the money to, from the increase, you know, their their job and their wages or whatever, by the fact of that they're now producing goods that are being imported to the U.S. So overall, everybody's living standard should come up, shouldn't it? Okay, uh, when we have increased, uh, you know, international trade. Now the uh, the problem is that there's a threat to domestic businesses. So if uh, you know brooms are being made in Ohio, and all of a sudden they're making those brooms in Mexico, what happens? The uh, I'm going to get a broom for a cheaper price if it's made more efficiently in Mexico. Mexican citizens are going to now have jobs that they didn't have before, maybe making brooms or whatever. Uh, but what's going to happen to uh, the factory person who was working in the broom factory in Ohio? They're going to suffer, right? They're going to sit there and lose their job, and they're going to say, well, our industrial base is being eroded away, et cetera, right? Okay, so these are some of the problems that you have with international trade and globalization and that it could harm one sector or one part of the country even though it may benefit uh, most of the country overall, but you have pockets of problems. That's why um, you see a lot of concern and a lot of focus and it's interesting to me how these issues follow the what they call swing states in the election so if you take a look at uh, a a state like Ohio where they have this sort of um, problem where they were manufacturing items that now are going offshore to be produced um, and so they're seeing pockets of unemployment you look at areas like uh, Pennsylvania where there's problems, Ohio, Pennsylvania, similar problems in a similar part of the country. And they call these swing states because these states often will have a pocket like that where there's an industrial base that's being affected by, off, uh, by globalization, offshoring of, uh, of production of product. Um, by the same time, they also will have uh, economic centers like or big cities like in if you look in Pennsylvania they have uh, they have Pittsburgh which is more of an industrial base but they also have what they also have Philadelphia which is more like a uh, metropolitan hub like you would have here in San Francisco um, you look at um, Ohio, you have areas like, I don't know, Columbus, Ohio, which is going to be more of an industrial base versus Cleveland, Ohio is going to be more of a metropolitan center. And so they call those swing states because there's often this tug back and forth between those states. And uh, of course, they uh, want to win those states as part of the electoral process. And so those states tend to be the key ones at play. But a driving factor in there is this issue of this offshoring of um, production for many of the things that were produced in those areas of the country. Um, so as a result, you have this threat to domestic business, their workers, and um, this leads to uh, some concerns and some problems with globalization. So um, what, uh, what do you think can be done about some of these things?
what could be done about some of these things, some of these problems. Okay, so no points for attendance today, right? Because you guys are going to just sit there and let me hang like that. So I'll make sure and not give you guys any points for this. Huh? No homework points today? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look. At Did you have something? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one then. Um, when we have free trade, okay, free trade basically is a situation where we don't have these sorts of uh, tariffs, uh, these sort of barriers to trade, which includes tariffs, subsidies, quotas, embargoes, okay, and so uh, tariffs um, basically are a tax in which they put a tax to import some of these different products and we put the tariff there to protect the domestic markets okay so we have tariffs and I mentioned some here um, paper clips sneakers okay they put tariffs on sneakers that are produced outside the country tobacco canned tuna I guess all of these things are tariffs where they put a tax that is going to increase the uh, cost of these items in the US when they're imported from outside and so um, consumers will do what they'll be interested in purchasing the stuff from the um, from the local uh, producers or the US producers so that protect protects US producers um, this is, I guess, what uh, Trump is talking about doing when he starts saying, well, look, uh, we're going to protect the local producers of items. And he starts talking about, well, we'll put a tax. Basically, if you leave the country and you produce offshore and you want to import those items back into the U.S., he says we're going to tax you to bring those back in. Well, that's essentially a tariff is what he's talking about doing there to protect uh, the local uh, producers or the U.S. producers. Subsidies is where the uh, government provides funding to businesses to basically uh, maybe build a plant or something inside of the United States that will help to uh, keep the jobs inside of the U.S. And uh, these subsidies uh, can lower the price of items for um, for consumers, but at the same time, uh, we're kind of defying that um, market equilibrium that we talked about before. Now, I mentioned the NFL here uh, as an example of an as a of a of a business that gets subsidies. What would be the subsidies that would go to the NFL? Subsidies to the NFL. Subsidy is where the um, government provides some sort of funding to build a factory or maybe even, um, you know, provides them with uh, just cash funding uh, to keep the business afloat. Right. Um, I don't know so much that they give them money for equipment, but they certainly give them money for a stadium, which is a pretty big piece of equipment, right? <laughs> okay, and there's a lot of discussion about how, you know, that a government, how come and this is the issue with the Raiders, and they're looking for Oakland to kick in some money, and everyone looks and says, well, wait a minute, San Francisco, the 49ers built their stadium all on private financing, didn't they? The Giants build their stadium, San Francisco Giants build their stadium using private uh, financing and there was no public subsidy that came in for that sort of thing. Okay, uh, They got rid of it in California, but they used to have uh, economic development uh, funding that was available for these sort of things, which would be an example of government subsidy. Well, they were in Oakland before they moved to Los Angeles, and then they, and then they came back to Oakland 
Um, not really. I mean, there's not much they can do. It's been t attempted a few times for the cities to get involved, and uh, they end up not having any legal rights on that. Um, they have tried to come in and say, well, how can uh, San Jose, when they're trying to move the A's down there, they actually sued Major League Baseball to say, how come – how is it that Major League Baseball has the right to the city of San Jose? We're San Jose, but uh, that was thrown out of court and that Major League Baseball has a constitution that uh, all the teams agree to and uh, the cities really don't have much of a right to say this is the team that's going to be in our city. I guess they could reject it if they wanted to. They don't have to have the team in that city, but I don't even know that uh, – I guess there'd be some negotiation there, but I don't even know that they could stop that if they really, uh, really didn't want, really, really uh, tried to. I don't know that they could stop it. I guess they could stop it. I don't think that they could cause it to happen, though, that it, where a team would come there. If the team, there was some other agreement that was stopping the team from going there. Huh? Do you know if they do that for um, tax purposes? Do what for tax purposes? What do you mean for tax purposes? Like not charge them tax? Um, the NFL was tax exempt uh, for several years. The NFL itself, the, the association, it was uh, tax exempt. Uh, they gave up that status because of the political uh, environment being everyone pointing to here you have this multi-billion dollar industry that's not paying tax um, but yeah you could offer uh, a, a ben tax benefit I think that's what they did with uh, the company I think it was I want to say it was is it Facebook that moved to uh, the mission not the mission district but uh, a certain part of the uh, Tenderloin area of San Francisco, they basically uh, gave them a tax break to move to that area to help, you know, the economic environment of that part of the city. So, yeah, they've done that where they'll offer tax breaks on that sort of thing. I don't know about for the NFL, but uh, they did it with that one. Sir, did you have a, a comment? Um, yeah. Yeah. Those have been in place for some time now, the oil subsidies, and, and they they do that for oil companies because they wanted to uh, they wanted to encourage exploration and stuff for oil was the reason that they originally put those in place. But those have been in place for some time. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Getting what for free? They get the oil for free. Pretty much. I mean, they ha they have to own the rights to the land, but once they get it, then, yeah. But they also get subsidies to, to do the exploration and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay, quotas is doing what? Is sitting there and um, causing the, um, only letting so much of a certain product from a certain country or of a certain product to come in to protect the industry, right? So that's going to do what? Pull back the supply. If there's only so many that can come in, that will protect the price, right? And protect the production of the U.S. companies. Embargo is where you don't let anything in from that country. Now, that's usually more of what? more of a political issue than it is an economic issue when you move to embargo. What's the classic example of an embargo? Country in which we have an embargo? Cuba, huh? Well, Cuba is the one that I think about a lot because I like I had a Cuban cigar before, and that's all I've thought about in terms of cigars since then. All other cigars pale compared to a Cuban cigar. And you say, well, where'd you have that if they're illegal? I actually had it in Beirut. Um, I was visiting Beirut, and they come to there, and they say, would you like a cigar, sir? And uh, Sure, and I look, and there's Cuban cigars, right? Well, yeah, I'll take a Cuban cigar. I'm in Beirut. I can do that. And so uh, that's an example of an embargo. Was there another example? Yeah. Um, 
what was the issue when they put cash on pallets to send it to Iran because they said that we don't even have bank accounts with Iran or something, so they had to put the cash, they sent them cash when they had to send them money because they don't have uh, banking relationships, so that's an example, that's an, pretty much an embargo, right? Any other examples? I've heard Cubans refer to the embargo as a blockade. That's the reason that if you go to Cuba, and now they're starting to allow for limited uh, trade between the U.S. and Cuba, but if you go right now, um, why do they why do they have all the you ever know seen pictures of Cuba where they have all the old vehicles in in Cuba? That's all you see are old vehicles. Why are they maintaining all those old vehicles? Because they can't get any of the new vehicles, that, so that's why it's almost frozen in time in terms of the vehicles and stuff. Because they haven't gotten anything new in the last you know 50 plus years uh, since uh, Castro took over. So. Um, so anyway, these are different ways. And, and that, again, the embargo becomes more of a political issue than it does a, an economic issue. But these others, subsidies, tariffs, absolutely, quotas, uh, local content requirements um, gets into that even if we are going to um, – import things some of the products that are part of that particular item should be made locally yes sir um I can't think of any where it would be economic, where you would just say, we're not going to let any of this in. The only thing I can think of is um, that's not so much political is the uh, imported drugs. Okay, That's going to be a little bit more of a uh, public safety issue, I guess, um, that they want to consider there. Although that kind of gets political too because these pharmaceutical companies they lobby quite a bit don't they and so it's questionable as to how much of that is also political as well right okay um Politics, <laughs> again, okay, um, basically deciding um, industries that, well, it's probably not all politics, an industry that's important to the U.S. Uh, ec uh, economy, okay, are probably going to be the ones that will be, uh, you know, look, looked at for uh, subsidies. So if you think about it, um, when uh, the U.S. bought GM stock, that, in effect, is a subsidy, isn't it? The federal government bought GM stock. Nobody else wanted to buy GM stock because they were getting going concern uh, reports on them from their auditors saying that we think this company is going to be going out of business. Nobody buys the stock of a company that's going to go out of business. So what happened? The federal government came in and bought that stock. Well, that's, in effect, a subsidy. Now, why were they willing to do that? Um, and that was really the Obama administration that really pushed that. They are willing to do that because um, the auto industry is not just the auto industry itself. It's the other industries that are affected. So if the U.S. automaker goes out of business, um, what do cars ride on? There's four of them, huh? Well, they ride on the road, but they also have they ride on wheels, don't they? So now you're affecting what? The rubber industry, aren't you? Okay, or what happens? The, uh, you know, the, the, the rug inside the car. The rug makers start to get affected. The guy that makes the little handle that you pull to turn the signal on and off is some factory that gets affected. So it's not just that one a company that gets affected, it's one industry that gets affected, it has ripple effects throughout the economy. So when you have a situation like that, that's where the government is more likely to say, okay, we're going to have to do something to subsidize and keep these guys uh, in, in business uh, for various, uh, various reasons. Um, I mean, national security. 
could be a reason for a subsidy. Okay, so if we're sitting there, um, I was on an assignment once. I don't know if these guys get subsidized or not. Um, there was this plant in Henderson, Nevada, and this plant, what it did was it produced the uh, oxidizer for the solid rocket fuel. Uh, that is used to um, fuel all the different missile programs and stuff. And uh, what happened was one of the plants blew up because they were sloppy with the way they were handling that oxidizer, and one spark blew the whole place up. Okay, And so then when they uh, looked around, they realized there was only one more plant that was left to produce that item. What happens if that one blows up? Now we don't have the plants or maybe subject to a terrorist attack or something like that. Okay. Um, now, I didn't follow the story all the way through because our whole job there was to describe some of the conditions that led to um, the problem that caused the explosion. And then also we looked at the security of the other plant and saw some security risks there and uh, mentioned those that, uh, you know, some things should be done to make sure the Department of Defense should make sure that there's appropriate security at a sole provider of something. But uh, that might be an instance where the government would step in and say, we're going to subsidize the construction of that plant that blew up. We're going to provide some funding for that because we need to have more than just one provider of something that has critical importance to national security. Okay, so that's the kinds of things where they might come in and, uh, and offer a subsidy, something that's very important to the economy or something that, uh, you know, is, is deals with a national security issue. For the NFL, you know, they want to keep these teams local because that also has an economic effect. So it's not so much the federal government subsidizing then as it might be what a, a local government like a city or something like that that's willing to subsidize the construction of a stadium because of the employment opportunities that come along with that. Okay. Uh, local content requirements, again, if the entire product isn't going to be made here, we'll say, well, at least the components that go into that item have to have so much, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, made products, et cetera. Um, when um, President Obama put the stimulus program into place, okay, they called that the American Recovery Act, ARA, forget what that all stood for, but... Uh, when they came in with that act and what the ARA um, legislation did is it said that uh, the government would provide funding for shovel-ready products, uh, projects. So if there was a project that was ready to go, the government would provide funding for that. And um, one of the things that was included in that was that they had to buy American. So let's say I'm a housing authority. Okay, I'm a housing authority. They provided funding under ARA for projects that the uh, housing agency had been intending to do. Let's say we're going to replace all of the air conditioning in probably in the public housing. You don't have air conditioning. All of the heating. Okay, they have heat. They typically don't have air conditioning. All of the heating in the public housing units. And so what happens when they, if they were ready to engage in that project, the federal government gave some money, but the stipulation was that all those items that you use had to be made in America. And when we went around and talked to uh, the housing agencies to see how they were implementing ARA, they told us sometimes we have a difficulty finding a U.S. company that makes the ducts or whatever that we're using for the uh, heating because so much of that work had been, you know, offshored out of sea, uh, overseas, et cetera, and they sometimes would have trouble finding a company that even manufactures uh, the product that they had to buy American. But obviously now what's going to happen? A company is going to be willing to get into that business now. That will increase local jobs or protect the few companies in the U.S. that make that. So, Again, um, these are all ways to, uh, I guess they call them barriers to free trade, right? Because instead of importing things from another country, we're going to make those things all here. Okay. Now, what are some of the uh, benefits to uh, free trade? Um, economic benefits, greater 
quantity and variety of higher quality products at lower prices. Protectionism, what? Increase sales at higher prices, improve the profitability, and protect domestic companies. The cost is going to be what? Lower quality and variety of goods and the economic cost of free trade is the potential for lost jobs, lower wages, that sort of thing, right? And so uh, we sit there and we need to back counterbalance these uh, costs and benefits. Okay. Um, again, uh, here we go with some of the uh, some of the uh, arguments in favor of protectionism, and there's that national security issue um, that I was mentioning. Infant industry. So we have an industry that we're trying to uh, get off the ground and think that uh, it'll, uh, you know, increase over time and help the U.S. maybe or whatever country to be a leader there. Um, the one that I'm thinking of is the solar panels and development of those, right? That might be somewhere where the government, and they, they have done that. They've provided uh, subsidies, et cetera, to uh, solar panel uh, companies, companies, solar companies and stuff that make money, although they lost some money on some of those. They actually uh, loaned some money, and then they lost some money on some of those. And it turns out the solar panel industry now um, you know, China has kind of filled that gap, and they're one of the major producers of the solar panels. So we kind of lost out on that opportunity there. But you might subsidize or put trade barriers up to protect an industry that you're thinking is going to be a leader in the future. Um, we have the issue of cheap foreign labor that uh, could be uh, a reason to protect uh, in other words, um, there's examples where um, Trump keeps talking about the factories that they're being built in Mexico now. And so what happens? Uh, we're building factories in Mexico, but what happens? We're not paying the appropriate wages that might seem, you know, might seem from a... Uh, humanitarian standpoint, the appropriate wages to be paying, so they're just making uh, cheap labor there, right? And they're just almost enslaving, if you will, uh, people in other countries. Um, threat of retaliation. If we put barriers on uh, trade, the other country might retaliate by, and I put in here, dumping. They could literally sit there and sell their product for less than their cost. So they're going to try to beat us in the long run on that, right? So even though um, they may lose money in the short run, in the long run, they're still going to put those U.S. companies out of business, aren't they? And so they could retaliate that way. Um, and that's something that gets, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, accusations about uh, companies dumping uh, their products on the U.S. at a very cheap price below their cost trying to, uh, trying to basically uh, provide, the, you know, put the other companies out of business so they would be the sole provider or the key provider of a particular product. Okay. Now, um, this is a little hard to see here. I put this, uh, this uh, chart in here because I thought it was pretty good and that it shows how if we have these uh, barriers to trade. We provide subsidies, or we go ahead and uh, put, you know, a blockade and embargo um, on on the uh, import of a particular item, or or put uh, tariffs in place, etc. What's going to happen is that's going to bring down the price of that product for the suppliers, and the suppliers are going to be willing to provide more of the product and that could over time bring the cost of that product down and there'll be a new market equilibrium. But in between, there's something called a dead weight loss until we find that new equilibrium. We'll have products being produced that no one is willing to buy at those prices until we find a new market equilibrium. And that's how you get into a situation where you've heard where the government will pay you know, farmers to produce items and nobody wants to buy them. So you'll have, you know, 
uh, wheat or whatever, I don't know if wheat rots, but you'll have produce rotting in the fields because nobody wants to buy those at those particular prices until we find a new uh, market equilibrium. So we call that a dead weight loss. Um, oh, one thing here, um, so there's economists who feel that you shouldn't provide any of these subsidies. What you should do is you should re-educate workers uh, to work into area, move into areas where there is increased uh, economic activity and out of some of those areas where there is decreased economic activity because a foreign competitor has uh, taken a market away and that over time that will be a better approach than just trying to hang on to those uh, markets, those products that are uh, the market for those products that are being produced overseas and uh, over time everyone will move up together. So what will happen? The consumer will get lower prices, the people that are displaced will find new opportunities, they will be in a growth industry, so they'll see benefits over time and that that is better than trying to uh, put subsidies in place, et cetera, that will, um, that will um, protect these markets. Okay. Now, there's a couple of agreements that have been in place for some time. Uh, one is the general agreement on tariffs and trade. And there's 23 member nations. And uh, really, what they're saying here is, look, rather than get into these uh, wars, et cetera, notice the years to when that's established, 48, right after World War II, okay, sort of like the whole idea with the United Nations, et cetera, rather than fight wars either economically or otherwise, hot wars versus, you know, Cold War, economic war, we're going to... Um, go ahead and have a general agreement on trades and tariffs so that in the future uh, we can negotiate these things rather than have the uh, you know international um, you know environment deteriorate as a result of these things uh, that was replaced by the world trade organization in uh, 1995 and uh, basically what it does is it arbitrates global trade disputes. If we say it arbitrates, what does that mean? If you have an arbitration, what does that mean? Huh? There's, there's different types of ways that we come to agreements with other parties. One is through negotiation. Okay, where we'll go back and forth on our own. We'll negotiate back and forth as to what we're going to do. One is, another one is what? Is mediation, where a third party will listen and say, okay, look, guys, this really is what you should do. But at the end of the day, it's up to us to agree. Okay, so the mediator will help the negotiation along. And then an arbitration is where there's an arbitrator and they tell us this is the solution and this is what you're going to follow, right? Okay. So this World Trade Organization can arbitrate the decision. They'll listen to the countries that are involved in this um, back and forth and usually there's a complaint that is issued to the WTO and then they have a hearing on that and each side can present their case but ultimately they're going to decide what happens right okay now they say that it has the power to enforce the decisions what would be how would they enforce the decision I'm the United States and I say no I'm not going to do what the WTO arbitrate I should do. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to agree. I'm not going to uh, limit the amount of, um, I'm not going to, you know, uh, stop importing at a certain price to this country or whatever. How would they stop it? What would they do to them? What, how would they enforce it? Are they going to send their army over? Is the WTO army going to come marching in and say, okay, we're taking over? Huh? You know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think the UN gets into trade issues. They're sort of like the UN of trade issues, right? Uh huh. Yeah. To get um, that president out. So right. That was out of that profession because they were asking them. So they just did it, right? So when it comes so in that case they're going to war, right? In this case all they're doing is selling some products at a price a cheaper price. So so really they have no power when you really think about it. I mean, they can't stop another country from doing something. So what would be what would be the power that they would have? So I go ahead and I don't listen to WTO. They arbitrate and I say, here, I'm not doing it. Now what? Now the other country is going to, with the blessing of this World Trade Organization, the other country, I should I say company, other country will say, okay, well, then we're going to do this. And we also have the blessing of 152 other countries at that point, right? Okay, so it's sort of a soft power, isn't it? Okay, it's almost, uh, well, you're going to face the uh, sort of... Uh, you know, brow breeding of the rest of the world. I mean, it's not like they have an army that comes in and requires a country to do something. So it really is a, uh, you know, almost a what, a, an association where we all agree to, uh, to listen, but uh, you don't have to. And I'm sure there's some countries that say, well, we're not going to go through this World Trade Organization. We're not going to do it. I find it interesting that um, when... Um, you hear in the debates, the debate, you know, Trump said, well, we're going to tax these companies if they're going to do this, and we're going to tax them to, pro to import their products back in. Nobody says, well, you know, the WTO might have something to say about that, Mr. Trump. I mean, it's not like you just go ahead and you decide to do that, and there's no worldwide consequences associated with just going ahead and making a decision like that, right? So, uh, but... Uh, I think what happens is it gets politics. You start mentioning the WTO and they in these discussions, and they start saying, oh, I don't like that person because they're too much of a policy person. All they talk about is policy, and they don't feel the real pain of people. Well, it's a reality that uh, you just can't go ahead and do things and not have something like the WTO come in and say, hey, we're not going to allow this. So. Okay, um, so we have these different trade agreements. The European Union is the largest. Is this country still part of it? What country is this? Let's turn this into a geography lesson. What country is this? Right here? Huh? This is the United Kingdom right here, right? Okay, and are they still part of this? They are saying, anyway, they're going to back out, although right now nobody knows, well, exactly what does that mean and how are you going to back out of it and what is the consequence of that? So there's still this sort of like, huh? And I think there was such shock and surprise that they actually did this that nobody thought past the idea of just the vote to uh, get out and how that's going to be implemented exactly. But a lot of it um, had less to do with economics and had more to do with what with social social issues right the problem uh, part of what happened with the European Union is it what eased up the borders and then when you had some of the crisis and what happening in uh, Syria and some of the refugees etc and some of those problems that to me had more to do with the vote to get out of the European Union than an economic one um, and so uh, it's kind of interesting that they've gotten out now and what the overall impact on that is going to be is 
is uh, interesting. This came up after uh, World War II, uh, 1957, is when they started it. But a lot of it was to avoid some of the problems that had caused World War II. And I think it's interesting that you know people vote for something like that and they don't understand the historical perspective and then you just decide to vote to get out. But uh, this is the European Union is the largest uh, of the uh, largest export, second largest uh, largest export and the second largest importer uh, in the world and it has one-third of the world's production so this is uh, was a big deal okay and uh, I listed the I got this off the internet of the different countries that are part and I noticed that they still had the United Kingdom uh, listed down here but uh, maybe because they're not officially out yet I don't know but you have all these different countries that are part of the European Union huh they're out now, okay. So I'm not sure why this website had them uh, had them listed as still being a member, but uh, maybe they hadn't updated it. Okay, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement (NAFTA) you hear a lot about. This was signed into law during the uh, Clinton administration, okay. And Clinton uh, Clinton one signed it, and uh, I heard Trump saying yesterday during the debate. He says, this is the worst trade agreement in the history of the world, he says. Um, and when he says that, he's talking to the broom manufacturers in Ohio. Now, I don't know if it's actually broom manufacturers in Ohio, but just using that as an example, that what, that factory is now in Mexico, right? And so, yeah, if you're a broom manufacturer in Ohio, he's right. It is the worst trade agreement ever uh, put into place. And he's talking to those people in Ohio because he wants to win that state with the election. Okay, so uh, what I did is I went ahead and uh, saw if there was agreement, you know, amongst economists that that is the worst uh, trade agreement ever. And uh, let's just look at some of the pros. It's a little hard to see, so I'll read some of these. And we talk about a tariff that is going to do what? Increase the price of items so that we protect the local uh, markets. And what NAFTA did was take away some of those tariffs, et cetera, so there'll be more free trade. And so the decreased trade restrictions bought about by NAFTA have made it easier for Americans to purchase Canadian and Mexican goods. Oh, NAFTA is Mexico. United States and Canada, right? And no one ever talks about, oh, jobs going to Canada. It's always, you know, let's talk about the jobs going to Mexico. Well, some things probably went to Canada, too. As of 2010, the most recent year for which these data were available, the United States received about a quarter of its import from these two countries, which are its second and third largest supplier of imported goods. In particular, the U.S. gets much of its crude oil, oil vehicles, machinery, and gold from these two countries as well as fresh produce, snack food, live animals, red meat. I don't know what the difference. Oh, I guess if the animal's still alive versus just being red meat and chilled and frozen foods. Uh, all three countries experience, experience real wage increases. According to November 12th, Washington Post article, a study done by the Federal Reserve Remember, the Federal Reserve is the uh, organization that has the Federal Reserve Board that makes the decision about interest rates, et cetera, showed that NAFTA increased wages by uh, in the U.S. by 0.17% and Canada by 0.96% and Mexico by 1.3%. We don't doubt that these economists were rigorous in their analysis, but numerous factors can affect wages, so it's difficult to tell how much of the influence uh, one factor really had. In other words, there could be other factors other than NAFTA that was causing this. Um, so NAFTA is credited with significantly increasing trade amongst the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. The U.S. alone traded $1.6 trillion in goods and services with its NAFTA partners in 2009, the latest year for which data are available. And the U.S. sold 32.2% of its exports to Canada and Mexico in 2010. Okay, so again, this thing is talking about the pros, and I didn't put the cons up here because the cons had nothing to do with 
the uh, of this study had nothing to do with economics. It was well. The problem is that you have now what you have U.S. companies moving their plants to Mexico, and the ultimate problem there, if you're not a broom maker in Ohio, is that now there's almost this slave labor thing where what we're give, paying such low wages to Mexicans to work in these factories. So they were more social issues of the cons. In economics. So when Trump says it's the worst trade agreement ever, I guess he's talking to broom manufacturers in Ohio and he's talking to Mexicans who are being treated like slaves in their own country, right? Is basically uh, who, he's, who he's talking about this harming. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, there's other regional ones as well. Uh, we don't need to get into the detail of all of these, but these are all uh, regional trade agreements. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of uh, questions here. U.S. consumer electronic companies has to shut down because it cannot compete against foreign manufacturers. For the United States, this is an example of a cost of international trade, right? Okay, the idea is, though, that we should be able to get these electronic products cheaper and higher quality. If the nation of Epsilon places a tax on all grapes imported from the nation of Zeta, Epsilon has imposed a what? A tariff? We put a tax on things, that's a tariff, right? Uh, number 33, the cheap foreign labor argument for protectionism refers to a lower wage often earned by foreign workers. Okay, Cheap foreign labor argument centers on that sometimes significantly lower wages paid to workers of foreign companies. How can domestic companies compete with these low wages? Sometimes they can't, which motivates government leaders to impose trade restrictions, etc. And... What they're not talking about here is the, the social aspect of a U.S. company going in and building a factory and paying, you know, barely livable wages, et cetera, and exploiting um, folks locally. And we talk about that in our uh, ethical chapter. Okay, 39 here. And again, these question numbers, I keep that so when I prepare the test, I'm going to go back and see where I got these questions from. A free trade area that includes Canada and the United States, but not Japan, is what? NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. I mean, all you need to know there is where Japan is, which is not in North America, right? Um, but, of course, Mexico is the other country that's part of NAFTA. Okay. Strategies for international business. Okay. Global is where I sell my product as it is wherever. I would think that uh, Apple is probably, with the iPhone, is probably global, right? They don't sit there and they don't have a different version of the Apple for uh, different uh, countries, okay? And so what's happening? The product is going to be standardized and uh, there's going to be price competition uh, for other similar products that would also be marketed in those other countries. Uh, with multi-domestic, okay, we will tailor the product now to the particular local market. And um, ex for example, I've heard you can go into McDonald's and order rice with your hamburger or something, right? In Ch in Japan, uh, um, so that might be trying to tailor your product to that particular market. Okay. Transitional, we're going to customize our product to those customers in those particular markets. And we're just simply trying to provide that uh, service uh, to those uh, particular um, customers in those particular foreign markets. Okay. Um, there's different strategies here. We could simply export our product to another country. We could implement a turnkey project in which we will basically go and say, here's all the uh, information that you need to begin producing the, our product in your country. 
we could sell franchises. I mean, that's probably what they do with something like McDonald's and KFC and that that you see in those other countries. They simply sell those franchises to owners in those uh, other countries. They could own it uh, outright, too. It's not like they have to sell it to others, but that would be a way of uh, expanding the different markets. Uh, signing license agreements. Um, licensing agreement... Uh, I was actually involved in a, uh, a, I still am involved in a CPA review course, and one of the things that the CPA review course wanted to do was start to expand into other uh, foreign markets, and so they expand into Japan, into China, into Brazil, even into the Middle East. Uh, we went to uh, Beirut, was when I mentioned when I was in Beirut, that was part of that work, and um, what they do is they simply sell the license to provide the product in that particular other country. And then all we do is we provide support from time to time by coming through and doing presentations about the U.S. CPA exam and that sort of thing. But the license belongs to those foreign companies that then just uh, provide the product. And what a lot of them do is they don't limit it to just the U.S. CPA. They have a lot of different uh, U.S. certifications that they provide uh, instruction on, and they have various courses that they've received the licensing for, and they those offer those to uh, citizens in, in their areas. Um, engaging contract manufacturing. Okay, we will simply produce um, those goods overseas and have a contract with that, or we could just basically own a subsidiary. Let's say we have a key supplier of something and it's a country, a company that is in another country. We could just go ahead and do what? Acquire that company. Now we can control that supplier, right? Okay, so all of these are ways that we can, uh, that we can uh, globalize. Oh, also joint ventures. Um, joint ventures were basically going to have each side put in their share of the um, of the uh, requirements for the project and will share any economic benefits. Strategic alliance is more where we're going to still maintain our independence from each other on this, but we're going to make some agreements that are going to benefit both companies. Okay, so they talk about some of the advantages, disadvantages to these different approaches, exporting, speed of entry, okay, uh, but we're going to do what? Uh, production site in lowest cost locations, uh, disadvantage, high transportation costs, threat of trade barriers, turnkey project, increased profits, but loss of technical know-how uh, to potential competitors once we sort of give them the key information they need to be able to do this after a while they may say okay we got it we don't need you anymore right and they can uh, get a hold of our technology franchising uh, may be difficult to maintain quality control licensing speed of entry but uh, the licensee may become a competitor uh, this was an issue when we went to China uh, there was concern that if we provide the how was the company that we were licensing going to protect uh, our copyright to that material because the copyright laws in China are different than they are in the U.S. and the enforcement of the copyright laws are somewhat lax in China. And one of the things that they said that uh, we would do is we would provide funding for investigation of breach of the licensing laws and if you present the evidence to the um, enforcement authorities in China pres presumably they'll go ahead and they will carry out from there once you've provided the uh, information for an investigation on that to me that sounded like it wasn't gonna work okay they were sitting around talking about okay this is how we're gonna do this and I'm thinking why would I even question maybe getting into a problem of violating a license when there could be that severe a penalty? And they were talking about, you know, jail time that would come along with violating a patent in, under Chinese law, et cetera. And I was like, well, then nobody would do this if they thought there was any chance of being caught. So, uh, but you have to consider these sort of things. And you can see some of the, uh, the uh, d advantages, disadvantages to these different approaches. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of these. Uh, Airbus competes on the basis of price. 
um, while selling a standardized or homogeneous product. That's what? That is simply global, where we're just going ahead and uh, selling our standardized product across the board, right? We're not changing it for the local market. A consumer product company competes around the world primarily by customizing or differentiating its product to meet unique local needs. The company is using, that was our multi-domestic approach where we tailor our product to meet the, uh, the needs of the local markets. McDonald's selling seaweed flavor fries in Asia is again what? Multi-domestic, okay, trying to tailor our product to the local markets okay okay so I'm gonna stop us there uh, we're gonna pick up and talk uh, more about how exchange rates can affect our ability to sell our products overseas etc okay next time and uh, then we'll get into what uh, chapter 5 okay if you're doing the math and you're looking forward to the midterm and saying well how are we going to get through all those chapters as the scheduled midterm date the answer is we probably won't and we won't so if we get to the midterm date and we haven't covered all those chapters we'll simply cover the including the midterm the chapters that we had covered up to that point so don't worry we'll uh, we'll handle it that way okay all right guys have a good rest of the day rest of the week i will see you next week and I'll try to get those videos up there uh, so you can take a look at those couple. I think they're pretty entertaining. Take you about 15 minutes to look at those. Bye-bye. Have a good day.